Ladies and gentlemen, you're very welcome to our online address by Antishuk Michal Martin TD, which opens the centerpiece week of the IIEA's 30th anniversary celebrations. My name is Catherine Day, and I'm delighted to be chairing this webinar. I'm looking forward to the Taoiseach's address on the important topic of Ireland in a changing European Union. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from the audience during our question and answer session. Today's event is the Brendan Halligan Memorial Lecture. Honouring the IIEA's founder and president, Brendan Halligan, who sadly passed away last August. Our friends at the IIEA Brussels honoured Brendan earlier this year with a speech by Mary Robinson, and now it's our turn to do the same. Throughout May, the Institute has been hosting leading policymakers and thought leaders to celebrate the IIEA's role of informing public discourse on European and international affairs over the past 30 years. To commemorate Brendan's own legacy as a writer, thinker, politician and European, this year we launched the Brendan Halligan Emerging Scholar Essay Competition. I'm delighted to announce that the winner of the competition is Lisa Clare Whitten, who is a PhD student at Queen's University Belfast. Lisa's essay reflected on Northern Ireland, contrasting its peripheral status at the moment of EU accession in 1973 with its central position in the Brexit debate at the moment of the UK's withdrawal. Her essay will be published on the Institute's website in due course. And I'd like to take this opportunity to congratulate Lisa Clare on behalf of the IIEA board and team. Now, before we get into today's topic in just a few minutes, I will run through the format and the usual housekeeping rules. The Taoiseach will speak to us for about 20 minutes on the key priorities for Ireland within the European Union and for the European Union on the world stage as a global actor. We will then go into questions and answers with our audience. I'm sure you're familiar with how this works by now. You can put questions using Zoom's dedicated Q&A function, which you should see on your screen. But so that we can keep all the questions coming into one place, we ask that you do use the Q&A function and not the chat function, please. Today's session, both the Taoiseach's initial speech and the Q&A that follows will be fully on the record. Finally, if you're watching today and want to join the discussion on Twitter, you are always welcome to do so. And we encourage you to use the hashtag, hashtag IIEA30. And now it is my honour to invite Antishuk Michal Martin to deliver the Brendan Halligan Memorial Lecture. Antishuk, thank you for accepting our invitation to celebrate with us and to look ahead to the next 30 years. We're all very eager to hear your address. Thank you very much indeed, um, Catherine. And thank you and indeed Rory uh, for your kind invitation uh, and welcome to today's event. I also want to congratulate Michael uh, and everyone at the IIEA for putting together an exceptional week uh, of events to mark 30 years of what is unquestionably Ireland's leading uh, think tank. This week's events are a great tribute uh, to your work, but also to the memory of the Institute's founder and guiding light, Brendan Halligan. Throughout his long and uh, impressive involvement in party politics, Brendan was always passionate and would never have wanted uh, to be called ecumenical. However, in this institute, he founded something which is still unique in Ireland, a place dedicated to reaching across party divides through rigorous research and challenging debate. The IIEA stands out in a country where too many policy debates go straight to the political fight without seeking perspective and reflection. And critically, it has provided an essential forum for engaging with fundamental challenges in European and wider international affairs. The Institute's work on climate, energy, security, trade, and other areas is vital for our country. At a moment in world history where populism and disinformation have become deeply corrosive, we need expert and independent forums for exploring and debating critical issues. After 30 years, there is no doubt that the IIEA is not only still relevant, it is more important than ever, and there is much to be learned from your approach. The Institute was founded during a dramatic period of development 
in the role and ambition of what was becoming the European Union. Under the visionary leadership of Jacques Delors, a new agenda was developed to reinvigorate Europe. It was understood that something had to be done to renew a model of cooperation, which too often was leading to deadlock. Equally, Europe was failing to fulfill anywhere near its potential for shared progress and development. For Ireland, the way forward at that time was absolutely clear. We needed the single market to be more complete to enable us to trade and attract investment. In the same way, economic and monetary union was an, import, was an opportunity for us to secure our place and influence within a much larger economic context. And of course, the cohesion agenda would enable us to build a knowledge intensive economy and begin the rapid development of our infrastructure. The decisions we took at that time, the faith which we reaffirmed in our European future opened up a new era of development in Ireland. I am absolutely clear in saying our country faces serious challenges today, which it must overcome. However, however, no one can argue against the fact that our country has achieved real and sustained progress because of the reforms of the European Union, which we supported 30 years ago. When Sean Lamas put our country on course for membership of what is today the European Union, he understood very well the risks that were involved. As far back as the 1920s, he had read discussions about how, how a Europe united in a strong multinational organization was needed for peace and prosperity. And part of this was the concern that Ireland was just too poor and too peripheral to participate. However, he believed that this concern was wrong, that Ireland could change the path of its history. Lamassa began his public career as a teenager fighting in the rising, ended it 50 years later, pushing for Ireland to join the great cause of European cooperation. And so it was that Ireland's European story became unique in a very important way. We are similar to many other states in that we were founded by nationalist revolutionaries after the First World War, but we are different in that these same revolutionaries went on to seek to secure the benefits of this independence through participation in a strong rules-based community of European nations. The key events of our membership of the European Union are well known. So too is an undeniable fact. Had we not joined the Union, we would be a significantly poorer, more isolated and more divided country. The Union is the greatest enabler of peace and progress in the history of Europe. But talking about past achievements is not enough when the Union is facing rising and unprecedented challenges. And in Ireland, this means we have to understand that we are right to celebrate the historic progress of the last 50 years, but our primary focus has to be on shaping the future. We cannot assume that attitudes and policies developed to meet the challenges of previous decades are still relevant. Our progress in the European Union was based on being willing to look at hard realities, take risks and embrace new approaches. We did this when we decided to join. We did this when we supported the single market and the euro. And we did this when we championed the expansion of the Union. And I believe we must again renew our approach as both Ireland and Europe seek to meet new challenges and address clear gaps in the workings of our shared Union. The process of renewing and reforming the Union needs an urgency and ambition which Ireland must help to shape. The last decade and a half has been turbulent for the European Union. The Great Recession exposed weaknesses in structure and rising forces of destructive nationalism have confronted it. The question for us is, will we play our role in helping the Union to regain its confidence and to show a new energy? Our guiding principle must be a simple one. A successful Ireland needs a successful European Union. And the truth is, that events of recent years have shown that we cannot take this success for granted. I believe we need a renewed urgency in our approach to Europe and to move on to a more active agenda. I want to address this by looking at four specific dimensions of how we can do this. Specifically, expanding the European Union's role, protecting the European Union's core principles, enabling a new relationship with the United Kingdom, and being more active on European Union matters in our own national politics. 
Last week, the government launched a programme of engagement with the Conference on the Future of Europe. Underpinning this is our support of the idea that we must have an honest and inclusive discussion about where the Union goes to from here. Minister Thomas Byrne is leading this process, and every member of government would be engaged with it. I would strongly urge everyone with views on the future of Europe and Ireland's role within it to participate in these consultations. For many years, one of the great problems faced by the Union is that people have placed expectations on it without giving it the resources or laws to achieve them. The Union itself has also often fallen for the trap of what psychologists call the law of the instrument, which is when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And in the specific context of the Union, this has led to a focus on a very limited range of economic and fiscal controls. This is why so often we have a very narrow debate. We saw this in the early years of the financial crisis, when the entire focus was on a very inflexible approach. The dramatic policy changes of 2011 and 2012 were only reached when every other approach had failed. I believe that one of the biggest changes we need to make is to restore the position of the European Union as a direct enabler of growth. And part of this is the need for a larger fiscal capacity. And this is why last year, with the support of the government, I put forward a position at the European Council, which was strongly in favour of expanding the European Union's budget, as well as creating a special COVID recovery fund. Now, this was in spite of the fact that Ireland is now a net contributor to the Union. When it comes to helping countries and regions to develop or to get through an economic shock, we need the Union to do more. Equally, we needed to have greater resources to help us all overcome critical challenges. We need the Union to be the enabler of much more aggressive innovation in tackling climate change and delivering energy security. This is an existential crisis which no one country can overcome by itself. Only by unleashing the full potential of researchers and innovators throughout Europe can we step change outcomes. I believe that the terrible pandemic which we have experienced over the past 14 months has again shown how countries need each other. And I believe that the case for significantly increasing the public health competencies of the European Union is stronger than it has ever been. A stronger European Centre for Disease Control is needed as an essential guidance for countries in reacting rapidly to developments and guiding critically common decisions. We have to make the decision-making procedures faster and more comprehensive. While there have been many adverse comments, the fact is that cooperation on vaccine ordering and manufacturing has, had a tremendous, has been a tremendous success for the European Union. It has demonstrated solidarity and it has saved lives within Europe and indeed across the wider world. Already 200 million doses of European manufactured vaccines have been administered in Europe and 200 million doses of European manufactured vaccines have been administered in the rest of the world. Ireland and nearly every other European country could have, could have had no guarantee of access to these vaccines outside of the European Union-led cooperation. And let's not miss the fact that no other major vaccine producer in the world has exported a significant number of vaccines. The United Kingdom and the US have exported almost nothing in comparison to Europe. Others have exported minor amounts and often with geopolitics rather than public health as the main focus. There's no doubt that at times the European Union has not been the most effective communicator on this matter, but it is substance, not spin, that matters. We have every right to be proud of and thankful to the European Union for its work in fighting the virus and distributing the vaccines which are helping us to restore hope. Public health challenges are likely to be just as difficult in the future, and a, Euro and a European Union with a greater leadership role in this field and the required resources is absolutely vital. In looking for ways of expanding the role and capacities of the Union, we need to be careful of ideas which are not soundly based. I very much support the idea of the European Union developing greater strategic autonomy. However, we have to be careful as we move forward towards determining what this means in practice. True European champions will come from supporting innovation 
rather than artificial controls or preferences. Wherever, wherever you look in the world, the models which offer us the biggest opportunity have been based on the active promotion of cutting edge research, a positive approach to startups and a consistent investment in skills. The wonderful example of BioNTech is one which shows us the way forward. A company founded by researchers from an immigrant background, BioNTech received direct funding, research funding and subsidized loans from the European Union and national schemes. The vaccine which they have developed with this assistance is a triumph of modern science and it is the most important vaccine helping Ireland and others to get through this pandemic. And that is exactly the type of European champion we need more of. Last week's European Union leaders took an important decision at our uh, social summit in Porto to reinforce our collective commitment to the social dimension of the Union. The Porto de Declaration makes clear that our shared European ideal is first and foremost about improving the lives of our citizens, guided by the political compass of our social pillar. It makes clear that the European Union as a community of values is much more than simply a marketplace. The concrete employment, skills and poverty reduction targets to be achieved by 2030 provide the right political emphasis for underpinning a strong and sustainable post-pandemic recovery. This means a recovery that is deeply rooted in equipping men, women, young, old, people with disabilities, those rural and urban, people with the skills and capabilities for full participation in economic and social life. It marks an important milestone in setting a progressive European Union agenda for the decade ahead. I believe that a European Union empowered with greater resources and critical new competencies in areas such as public health and climate change can ensure that Europe remains a strong, dynamic and prosperous community of nations. However, we must also understand that there's work to be done to protect the core principles which underpin the European Union. Both within the Union and internationally, there are forces which oppose the idea of countries being subject to agreed rules, including the protection of democracy and human rights. In the last century, the European Union ended centuries of conflict and division on the basis of states agreeing shared values. These can no longer be taken for granted. Where once people talked of the triumph of liberal democracy, in recent years, people have begun to write about the retreat of democracy. The brilliant and provocative political scientist, Ivan Krastev, a man profoundly committed to democratic ideals, has gone as far as to ask if we have gone from the end of history to the end of Europe. Ireland cannot stand on the sidelines. We are a democratic republic. Our constitution commits us to the ideal of international cooperation and asserts our support for the principles enshrined in the European treaties. We must work with others who share these beliefs. I strongly support the new commitment to multilateralism and democracy, which we've discussed with President Joe Biden. Just as he is bringing a new beginning to the relationship between the United States and the wider world, we must work with him and with each other in the cause of defending democracy. Last Friday, I stressed to Prime Minister Johnson how Ireland wants to help rebuild a constructive and sustainable relationship between the European Union and the United Kingdom. The referendum, together with the decades of anti-European Union rhetoric which preceded it, and the drawn out negotiations which followed, caused damage which cannot be undone. As I've said many times before, Brexit is a major step backwards and there is no upside to it. However, it is now a reality and we must do whatever we can to limit the scale of its negative impact. The trade and cooperation agreement between the European Union and the United Kingdom, taken together with the withdrawal agreement, including the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, represent the best possible outcome in the circumstances. There is no useful purpose served in keeping the debate about Brexit going. If we want what is best for us all, then we need to retire this dispute and focus on the full and effective implementation of what has been agreed. We need good faith and cooperation, and we need to understand that the first reflex when there is a problem should be to seek engagement, not to promote a dispute. It should, however, be acknowledged 
that this relationship can never be the same as the relationship between EU member states, however hard we work on making it the best it can be. Tomorrow, you will hear from both Bertie Ahern and Tony Blair in a reminder of just how much can be achieved by the Dublin and London governments when we work closely together. What they achieved together for our countries was and remains historic. And that was a partnership which they insisted was reflected in every part of their governments. I particularly remember how it was agreed that disputes, of which there were many, were to be dealt with in a spirit of open discussion and good faith. The absence of the joint context of the European Union is a major challenge and one which we are working to address. In addition to the economic consequences and the implications for Northern Ireland with the UK's departure, Ireland has lost an important partner uh, in the European Union with whom we collaborated on many issues. The need for Ireland now to build alliances with member states across the European Union has never been more evident. We have strengthened across the Union in order to broaden and deepen our contacts with, partner, contacts with partners. This includes a new approach to engaging with countries of different sizes and with different priorities. Fundamentally, we are in a period where the future direction and success of the European Union is at stake. We need to be honest and admit that we have often failed to treat European Union issues with urgency within our politics. Given just how central a successful European Union is to prosperity and progress in our country, this has to change. Those of us who believe in the ideals of the Union have to be aware that Euroscepticism is a very real part uh, of Irish politics, but it is too rarely confronted. In country after country, we can see what happens when anti-European Union sentiment is allowed to go unchallenged. A significant proportion of our representation in the European Parliament constantly attacks the Union as an elite conspiracy against the people. Parties who opposed Irish membership of the Union, who fought against every treaty change and blamed the Union for everything, have an agenda which is shared with anti-EU parties throughout Europe. The greatest mistake made in the United Kingdom was the casual assumption that there was only so far the anti-EU forces would go and that economic reality would always stand in their way. The basic Eurosceptic populism which drove the anti-EU campaign was ignored for, for too long and not enough was done to challenge them. We can't make that mistake here just because we are in a period where public appreciation of the European Union is very high. We have to make our case of how central the European Union is not just to our past development but to our future progress. We have to call out those who promote populist attacks on the Union, but pretend that they aren't actually anti-EU. And we have to make public engagement on EU matters a permanent part of how we talk about issues. Part of this is that we have to help the public to separate the signal from the noise. This can only be done through investing in transparent, evidence-based discussion. And often this is about mapping out not just the gray area, but the rainbow of opinion that legitimately sit between black and white on complex EU issues. Because the price of misinformation and disinformation and reductivist debates are incredibly high. Just last week, I participated in the latest Christchurch call, a movement set up by Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, and President Emmanuel Macron, in the wake of the terrorist attacks on two mosques in New Zealand. The immediate focus of the call is to, remove, is to remove violent extremist and terrorist content. But the longer term work is for a free, open and secure internet, not one awash with automated misinformation that leads to radicalization and incitement of violence in the first place and built with algorithms that narrow opinions and lead people into cul-de-sac worldviews. And that is why investing in informed and transparent public discourse will remain a priority for me whether that is through the citizens' assemblies, the dialogues of the Shared Island Initiative, or over the coming period through the Conference on the Future of Europe events. After a period where people begin to question the very foundations of the European Union, self-confidence is beginning to return. This brings with it an opportunity to reshape our future direction, an opportunity which we cannot afford to squander. Ireland's membership of the European Union has been an incredibly positive chapter in our history. However, this must evolve. We must understand that the challenges of today 
are very different uh, to those we faced in the past. We need to help the Union to develop new competencies, to focus on the critical needs of Europe today and to ensure that it has resources to make a difference. We have to be active in defending the principles of multilateral cooperation and the values of democracy when they're facing increasing threats. We have to help rebuild the critical relationship with the United Kingdom, which has been so profoundly changed in recent years. And we have to understand that Europe is too important to be an afterthought in our politics. It has to gain a greater prominence and we need ongoing engagement with our people. The European Union is a remarkable example of how peace and prosperity can be won through cooperation. It helped Europe to rebuild after a catastrophic series of conflicts, and it helped the United States on the basis of shared interests and values. Over nearly 50 years of membership, Ireland has changed dramatically, and equally, the European Union has changed dramatically. There have been key moments when fundamental decisions have been required in order to renew and energize the Union. This is another one of those moments, and it falls to Ireland to speak up and work for a European Union which preserves its values and builds on its great achievements. Thank you very much indeed. Ishak, thank you so much. That was a fantastic uh, tour of uh, a huge range of issues. You covered the role, the future role and the competences of the EU, its values. You uh, point out areas of agreement, but I think also hinted at areas where Ireland has different views from those of some other states. Um, and all of that is going to go into a, a terrific mix of discussions on where is the EU headed next um, in the coming months. Now, we, as you might expect, uh, from having covered such a range of topics. We have lots of questions coming in and I'm going to go straight uh, to them. The first one comes from Audrin Reid. He says, Taoiseach, you're clearly a committed European. Do you believe Ireland should be at the centre of the debate on the future of the EU, driving forward institutional change and further integration? Much of what we ha have now has been influenced by our departed neighbour and the institutions now need to address future challenges. Um, in, in short, uh, yes, I think we should be open to further uh, changes. And I think the Conference on the Future of Europe gives us an opportunity uh, to be leaders in this debate. Um, I've identified the public health area, uh, obviously in the context of the pandemic, as one where we should take this opportunity and learn lessons from the pandemic uh, in terms of a stronger European competency. I, I've been a former Minister for Health and I can contrast our position back during SARS when I was Minister for Health in 2003. And uh, the contrast is quite dramatic, actually. At that stage in 2003, we were nowhere near collaboration with industry that would produce vaccines in 12 months. There was no agreements, pre-purchase, or anything like that. Um, and to be honest, at times during SARS, uh, there was a lot of scrambling to try and get a co cohesive approach across Europe. Whereas on this occasion, notwithstanding all of the difficulties and challenges, uh, I think the pre-purchase agreements the engagement uh, has been effective in producing uh, quite a number of safe vaccines in a very short space of time, which many people didn't think was possible at the outset of the pandemic. Now, what's interesting is the Commission and Europe isn't you know, hanging back. It now has developed a HERO initiative, the HERA, H-E-R-A, sorry, my pronunciation, basically, which is a collaboration involving uh, bi biotech companies, uh, the manufacturers, uh, Europe, to say, okay, what are the new challenges with this pandemic? The variants, for example, teenagers and children. And therefore we need to continue the manufacturing of vaccines, uh, the ordering of them, uh, but also the authorization process within Europe needs to be addressed. Um, and that work is now well underway. And you saw that recently manifested in the ordering of hundreds and hundreds of millions of vaccines for 2022 and 2023, but critically better research so based on mRNA vaccines and protein vaccines uh, that have the capacity to be adjusted quickly. Uh, and then Europe acknowledges this authorization processes could be quicker in the context of variants. So yes, is the answer in short. Uh, I did instance also the own resources decision we took or the decision that we would collectively borrow in general. That was a very hot meeting. And it was interesting from our perspective that Ireland being a net contributor was up against other net contributors 
on behalf of countries that were going to receive an awful lot more. That actually was kind of a big shift from where historically we would have been within the Union. But we have to convey to our own public that if Europe does well, Ireland is an open economy, exporting will do very well as well. Thank you, Tishuk. Um, next question from Tony Brown, who's a founding member of the Institute. And you referenced the Porto Social uh, Summit of last week. Tony's question is, can the Porto Social Commitment succeed where past statements have promised more than they could achieve? Interestingly, at the, the, the meeting last week, at the informal council last week, there was quite a number of contributions from prime ministers on the follow through uh, after Porto. Um, what instruments or what mechanisms, so the semester mechanisms will be used, can we uh, achieve concrete outcomes? From the declaration of, of, of principles and i think there was a large uh, consensus on some of the key issues uh, child poverty for example um, education and achievement uh, school completion uh, progression onto further and third education the whole skills agenda uh, for young people particularly in the post-endemic environment so i do get the sense that there will be a strong focus on follow-through uh, from the declaration but we put meat on the bone of the targets Thank you, Tishak. Uh, and who knows, maybe the departure of the UK, which was re notoriously reluctant on this topic, may even have a po some yeah. positive effect. Um, next question from Professor John O'Brennan of Maynooth. He references the Good Friday Agreement and his question relates to Bosnia. He says, given Ireland's unique sensibility around conflict, does the Taoiseach agree that the integration of the Western Balkans, including Bosnia, with the EU is an urgent necessity and that Ireland should do everything possible to assist Bosnia and other states in the Western Balkans move closer to the European Union? Uh, I do, and I think we, we always should, in a humble way, um, apply the learnings that we have garnered over the years from our own uh, peace process uh, to other situations, uh, and we are supportive of, of that integration uh, of the Western Balkans uh, into the European Union and to, to progress that. Um, and um, it's interesting, even in the context of the pandemic, that Europe was very conscious of its neighbourhood um, and almost looked at it as part, you know, in terms of making sure that vaccines could get distributed and so on. That's just a small manifestation of, I think, what is what, what, what is the overall approach, and we, I think, we, we should be. Uh, proactive in that regard. Thank you very much, Taoiseach. Now, um, a question from a former colleague of yours, Prince Sirosa. Why has treaty change been ruled out by Ireland? It's not been ruled out. <laughs> so, I know there have been various communications on that, and the, uh, I've spoken to the other two leaders within the government, um, and all three leaders are clear that we have to be open to potential treaty change. Obviously, there's a desire in the context of the, the future of the Conference of Europe that we also discuss um, issues, uh, sorry, that, that we would discuss uh, utilising and harnessing the existing potential within the existing treaties for the citizens, uh, uh, and that we don't get bogged down in too much technocratic or legal rules. On the other hand, though, uh, you know, I've made it clear that we have to be open to treaty change. Uh, and we can't close that door, and uh, notwithstanding the challenges it presents. But um, so I just want to make that clear, and, and that's that's something that the three leaders have agreed on within government that we are open to treaty change. Thank you, Tishuk. Um, moving then to a question from Etienne Tannum of Trinity College: um, How can Ireland play a positive, calm head role in protocol negotiations, but also not create criticism of siding with the UK? That's a delicate that's, that's what I thought we were doing. <laughs> Just, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, I think CAM is a very, very important word to, to be in, in this context. Um, and I think we have to retain this at the level of trade and the, the technical issues around trade. It's not an issue of identity. It's not an issue of sovereignty in the context of the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, it doesn't interfere with the principle of, of, of consent. Um, and um, uh, I think our strong view, and in our discussions with, with the UK government, has been that there is a process there within the withdrawal agreement uh, through the joint committees and through discussions to refine and to resolve any issues uh, that have arisen as a result of the operation of the protocol. Um, and I know that Maris Sefcovic is adopting a very constructive role in his discussions with David Frost, and indeed the European Union is. And I stress that again 
uh, to close this week uh, uh, to, to the British Prime Minister that Europe is not in this uh, participant in these discussions with a view to try and punish the UK or anything like that, but rather its solution, it's in solution mode, Europe is, without question, in trying to resolve this issue. Uh, and so is Ireland. It is fundamentally an EU UK process, but Ireland uh, has, um, you know, uh, certainly made the EU aware of the sensitivities around this. Uh, and we've also put forward helpful suggestions and ideas as to how these issues can be resolved. And I believe, in a practical way, you know, um, working together on SPS, for example, offers really good dividend in terms of practical outcomes of these discussions. But um, we do have to keep this at, at the right level. It's interesting as well that there are other positives around the protocol that don't get articulated. Uh, I was reading recently in terms of the impact for Ulster farmers, for example, in terms of uh, their milk coming into co-ops in the Republic and so on. And the protocol facilitates that in a seamless way, which is very valuable for the dairy industry on the island in terms of the movement of, of, of product and so on uh, north and south. Um, and I get the sense that a lot of middle ground opinion in the north, particularly in business and in agriculture, it, you know, get the sense of the protocol, but obviously don't want to put their heads above the parapet in the context of the politics of all of this. Uh, so we do need to, to diffuse this. We need to kind of keep it calm um, and, and work through it. And there are processes uh, to work through this and to uh, you know, make it a sensible arrangement for all concerned. Um, thank you, Tishak. Again, Brexit obviously uh, giving rise to quite a number of questions. We'll take one more and then I'll move on. This one is from Porik Halpin of Reuters. He says RTE reported this morning that the Irish government is now concerned that London is pushing for a complete rewriting of the Northern Ireland Protocol beyond simply bringing flexibilities to bear. Can the Taoiseach confirm if this is the case? Um, obviously, we discussions on Friday. I can't. Uh, my view, what we agreed on Friday was that we would continue to work through the European Union UK process. Now, there was no formal agreement at the end of the meeting. It was an exploratory meeting, but essentially. Uh, the guts of this was, and we put forward the case, that the, there's a process there between the European Union and the United Kingdom uh, that should be followed. And as I said, we, we, we'll be helpful in terms of suggestions and ideas. Um, but we would be, we, are, we were very clear and are very clear that this is an international agreement and commitments have been made and people have signed up to it. Uh, and it needs to be worked and it needs to be, and the processes and mechanisms that are contained within it need to be worked also. Uh, but um, uh, that wasn't our immediate sense com coming from the meeting. Uh, thank you, Tisha. On a different topic now, a question from Anne Barrington. She says, as we grapple with the housing crisis here, one of the issues that continues to be raised is that EU state aid rules hinder member states from supporting social and affordable housing. This is, of course, not the case as housing falls within services of general economic interest. However, could the Conference on the Future of Europe be a means by which Ireland could make this work to make this explicit? We could. And in fact, in terms of some of our affordable housing schemes, they have gone to the Commission to seek clearance and clarity and all of that. But that has come too, you know. Uh, but that process has happened. Uh, and one is always mindful of, of, of state aid rules. So certainly the Conference for Europe does represent an opportunity uh, to, to uh, get greater clarity around that, particularly in terms of meeting social objectives um, in relation to key um, social policy areas. And housing is obviously the, the uh, number one crisis facing the country uh, generationally. And uh, we have to do everything we possibly can to get supply of houses uh, up. Uh, we're just not simply building enough houses at the moment in Ireland and haven't been for quite some time. Uh, and so we have to, uh, across a range of initiatives and a range of fronts, uh, social, um, affordable, um, uh, with the state now being the key actor at the moment in terms of the provision of funding for housing, we need to, to get a, a supply increased and um, that, that is our agenda. Uh, thank you Taoiseach. Uh, next a question from Thomas Conway who's a student in Trinity College. He says the Taoiseach emphasised the importance of developing greater fiscal capacity at EU level um, and he is wondering if you could offer some advice Sorry, the question is jumping. If you could offer some um, advice on how the EU can expand its fiscal capacity without infringing on autonomy of member states, particularly in terms of corporate tax policy. 
Yeah, well, the, the EU has already put forward um, a number of areas, and in fact, recently, in, in terms of uh, you know, in, in terms of the area of own resources, in terms of uh, plastic levies and so forth, and um, uh, ETS uh, mechanisms, uh, in the context of the decision taken last July, I know quite a number of those have to be fleshed out yet, um, but uh, they are being developed, um, and. Uh, the, in terms of the wider issue of, of, of cooperation tax, the OECD is now, right now, the favoured forum um, for seeking to uh, reach a global agreement in terms of the uh, corporate, tax, corporate tax regime across the world. Uh, obviously, that will fall to get discussed at European level at some stage. There has been debate within the European Union around digital, uh, the digital area and the digital space which we're engaging in, uh, and those discussions are, are ongoing and will be for quite some time. But the overall point I was making, and that, that is why we uh, contributed so strongly in July to the uh, Recovery Next Generation European Fund to build, rebuild Europe in the aftermath of the pandemic, uh, because we're a small open economy. We will benefit if European economies benefit, if you know, other countries really develop, and we will do well in that scenario. Um, but that will need underpinning by own resources. The borrowing will need to be met with generation of own resources, and the Commission is coming forward, uh, short of cooperation tax and all of that, but is coming forward with a number of mechanisms uh, to raise uh, funding uh, at, at a European level, and I think that is important, and we're, we're, we're going to be a constructive contributor uh, to that. The issue of own resources has been brewing for a very long time, but maybe the time has now come to, <laughs> to give the answer. Um, Tishuk, a question from Bobby McDonough. Should Ireland consider some flexibility as regards the unanimity provisions on foreign policy? On the one hand, it's very sensitive. On the other, if the EU is to take clear-cut positions, for example, on the Gaza crisis, something needs to change. Uh, it does, but I mean, therein, if you highlight the Gaza context, you could get uh, certain countries um, boxed into a situation that they would be very uncomfortable with uh, in terms of whatever uh, majority position would emerge. Um, and, um, you know, as a former Minister for Foreign Affairs, I remember uh, at the time of the, 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 the then war in Gaza, I think in 2009, I, I would have taken a position that would have not been the majority position within the, uh, the European Council at the time uh, when I spoke out against what was happening within Gaza. Um, and so it is a very sensitive area, uh, and I think there, in fairness, there is a lot of genuine engagement on, on, on the issues. Very often, Europe doesn't present itself as strongly as it should. So, for example, you know, even on our domestic parliament, people keep attacking Europe as not being strong in support of Palestinians, for example, whereas Europe is probably one of the strongest funders and supporters of UNRWA uh, and has been the most consistent supporter of UNRWA. And I visited the education facilities in Gaza, which are supported by that funding and by Irish funding. Uh, and Europe has a role to play in terms of conflict resolution. Uh, so we condemn the, 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 you know, the, the, the rockets from, from Hamas, uh, but equally, I think we have to be strong in terms of the disproportionate, uh, in my view, disproportionate response of the Israeli government. And the world is appalled at the uh, deaths of so many innocents, of, of, of children and, and, and civilians. Uh, and that is something that the European Union, in my view, uh, needs to have a stronger leverage in terms of trying to get a, um, a more balanced approach to this. And, and, and we need, we, you know, we, we've called for an end to the conflict. We are on the Security Council. We're very clear uh, that hostilities should cease. Um, and um, in, in my view, the world is looking on appalled. And uh, it's a very sensitive area. Uh, and, and certain countries will want to reserve for themselves some you know, degree of nuance or approach in terms of how it articulates on, on these issues. But on the fundamental policy instruments, uh, there is a lot of consensus in terms of doing the right thing and supporting uh, particularly relief organisations, educational organisations in very difficult conflict, conflict situations like this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tishuk. Uh, you covered a huge amount of ground in your address and our audience is covering similarly a huge amount of ground in the questions. We have two here on the area of the digital economy. Liam Roach asks, does the Tishuk agree that we need more EU integration, for example, in health uh, services and uh, cybersecurity? And Seamus Allen, who's an IIEA researcher, 
asks, does the Taoiseach have views on the European Commission's emphasis on prioritising digital policy and its emphasis on digital sovereignty? Yeah, um, first of all, uh, I do support um, uh, st stronger digital um, uh, integration. Uh, first of all, I, I think the two key principles that emerged from the Recovery Fund and, 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 and the very clear prioritisation of digital transition and green economy uh, is the correct strategy and our Recovery and Resilience Fund application will reflect those two key themes. And in terms of health in particular, um, it's been a weaker area for Ireland in terms of the digital transformation of our health services, um, but it's improving in recent times and in fact in our Recovery and Resilience Fund application we will be highlighting the need and, and seeking funding in addition to our own domestic funding to accelerate the digital transformation of our health service. That's something I'm very keen on and have been for the last 10 months as Taoiseach to try and drive that particular agenda uh, and have worked with the Minister for Health and the uh, HSC um, in that respect. And as I said, across Europe, um, I think traditionally and historically there's been a reluctance to allow Europe um, move into the health space too much. Um, and I can recall being a health minister when officials, even in my own department back then, would be horrified at the prospect of we opening up the borders and health, fearing sort of impossible burdens on health services. And I think that was all, uh, in my view, in retrospect and in hindsight, over alarmist. Uh, I think there's an awful lot to be gained um, from a greater integration in, in health with obviously common sense subsidiarity applying, but on the big macro pictures of public health, uh, there is no uh, argument in my view. And I would feel that there's a greater need for science, health science, research, public health at European level needs to be more joined up than it currently is. That's my view. Uh, and I think the president of the commission is moving in that direction. I've had discussions with Ursula von der Leyen on this point, uh, and I would be a very strong advocate for this. Uh, I mean, even within the context of authorization of vaccines, we have the EMEA, yet it goes back to each national authorization body. Uh, and um, that could be improved. Uh, that could be improved in terms of the efficiency of how Europe operates medicine authorizations, vaccine authorizations. Uh, and, and that's something I would be very keen on. In terms of cyber security, this is one of the areas where we absolutely need a European Union approach a collaborative collaboration approach. And I have to say, we've been very grateful to our, our partners uh, in Europe and indeed in the United Kingdom who are helping and who are uh, offering assistance as we face the current threat uh, and attack on our, on, our, on our national health service. And um, these are ruthless criminals who uh, are undermining our, our, our people and our patients through access to health services. And there's been a very uh, gratifying uh, international uh, support uh, particularly across Europe in terms of, uh, of this attack. And there's no question that these are the type of strategic uh, vulnerabilities that all member states face that can only be more robustly, more robustly um, taken on uh, on a collective basis. In fact, it's often the case that um, we find the political will to move forward as a European Union more faster in times of crisis than at other times. That's um, absolutely true. Taoiseach, back to the, the UK again, uh, Professor John O'Hagan from Trinity uh, asks, do you think Taoiseach that Ireland and the EU should stay totally out of any future Scottish independence referendum, including making any comments on fast track EU membership for Scotland, should the referendum vote be carried? It's a fair point. Um, I, I think, you know, in, in democracies you know, and in, in the world, people uh, are entitled to express opinions and, and articulate perspectives, but Yes, I think it's fundamentally a matter now for the Scottish people or indeed for the United Kingdom as a whole uh, to decide on those issues. Um, what's interesting is, uh, if in, against the, the grain of your question, I just offer the viewpoint, Brexit has created uh, new debates, has affected the relationships um, within the United Kingdom itself. And that's interesting in terms of the Scottish London uh, relationship. So it's see, it, it would be interesting to see how it unfolds. Um, and um, but I don't think the European Union should yeah should get embroiled in it. It doesn't need to get embroiled in it. Um, and sometimes uh, the, the old Irish uh, Shannon is being bailed at host. You know sometimes uh, silence can be golden. <laughs> Might apply.
Thank you, Taoiseach. Um, a question from Pat Leahy of the Irish Times. How concerned is the Taoiseach about the growing movement in unionism against the protocol? Does the Irish, how does the Irish government respond? Well, I think the, it is a concern um, in terms of the, as I said earlier, this elevation of the protocol beyond what it essentially is in, in terms of trade and a technical trade uh, arrangement. Um, and as I say, in our view, and we're strongly of the view that this is an agreement that has been signed up to um, by the UK government. Um, and it needs to honour that agreement with all of us. But we're all available and, and, and there to work the process that has been laid down by that agreement, which joint committees, and there's a process there between the EU and the UK. Uh, our objective is to work hard to resolve and refine any of the issues that have emerged. Um, but it is our view uh, that the protocol and the withdrawal agreement represents the, the best outcome uh, overall in, in terms of the future uh, of the island, and particularly in Northern Ireland in the context of continuing to have access uh, to the European market, which I think from a foreign direct investment perspective and for some key sectors will be very advantageous. Uh, and also then we have to facilitate smooth uh, obviously, movement of goods uh, from the UK to, to Northern Ireland as well. I think that that is accepted, and I think the, the, the issue now is the mechanism by which we resolve this. Um, thank you again, Taoiseach. Question this time from Michael Collins, who's the Director General of the Institute. With the UK gone, who are Ireland's most like-minded in the EU? In other words, who are our natural allies? Hmm. Um, sometimes it depends on the issue. <laughs> uh, uh, so it was interesting, you know, on this whole issue of export controls, uh, some of those of us with strong um, pharmaceutical industries uh, had very clear views on this, but also with strong sort of views around open trade and free trade, uh, that we were negative about the idea of export controls. So Belgium, Belgium uh, Ireland, Netherlands and, and others uh, were, were close allies on that. Um, uh, and, and more broadly speaking, uh, you know, I think we're we very often can depend on the issues. Uh, there's, uh, you know, as I said, normally countries that we would have agreement with, um, we, we would have disagreed with in July in terms of the, um, the, the amount of money for the next generation fund. Uh, so I think we have to work consistently across all member states. Uh, and I work to develop a strong relationship with all prime ministers. Um, there are some that in, in, in countries where we, you know, on the climate, we have a very strong alliance with quite a number of like-minded countries who want to be ambitious for climate. Uh, and so that, that would be a very challenging debate uh, in, at the next EU Council meeting. The last EU Council meeting of that in December took 23 hours uh, to get resolution on climate. And obviously Poland, Hungary and others had big issues. And that was at a principles level, if, if, at, at the level of principles, sorry as opposed to burden sharing or the more thornier, thornier issues of uh, who gets to do what or who gets certain exemptions and so on, which all has to happen. Um, so I, that, that may not give Michael the complete answer in relation to that, but I think there has to be a flexibility and there has to be an open approach uh, uh, to, based on, on the issues as they emerge. There are some natural ones that, that are there already. Thank you, Tishak. Um, again, a different topic for a question from Anna Doyle. How does the Taoiseach envisage using our position in the EU to foster greater use of the Irish language at home and throughout Europe in order to reinforce our identity and to seize this opportunity to promote our native language on a European and a global platform? Yeah, I think to be fair, I think we need to do more on that, and inclu including myself. And um, uh, I think we need to strategically look at how best we can ourselves articulate uh, utilising the Irish language, but also reflecting it back. I think what's interesting is the number of people who are now progressing to a career in Europe through the Irish language is growing. And that in itself will create its own momentum, I think, in terms of how we, um, if you like, use this new opportunity, new platform uh, to improve and enhance the status of the Irish language and reflect that back to the domestic use. Of, of, of the Irish language, and that could reflect itself in terms of um, debates within uh, within our grade school and within our schools, relating to European um, affairs and European matters. Uh, and uh, I think there's a bit more work for us strategically to do in terms of how we can uh, use the new status within the European Union that the Irish language now enjoys 
back into the, to the domestic policy. Mm -hmm. um, Tisha, the next question comes from Professor Porik Kana of NUI Galway. Do you see a much more central role for the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights in the functioning of the EU institutions now that the UK has left the Union? I do, um, but there are other challenges uh, in terms of, 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 of the application of that charter and other countries may have, as we know, a, a different perspectives, but I do actually see uh, opportunities uh, for that charter in terms of its application. Um, there's a, there is also you know, growing debate within Europe or concerns within Europe in terms of, as I said earlier in my speech, about a retreat from democracy and basic values in terms of the free media, uh, freedom of speech, greater control has been exerted by certain countries and certain states. So that's an ongoing concern for us all. Um, and uh, you know, sometimes the UK unnecessarily, in my view, uh, sorry, not always um, rightly gets, gets a bad press in some respects of this, but very often the United Kingdom has been a, a strong advocate for quite fundamental values mm -hmm. in terms of human rights and issues as well, to be fair. Uh, and I think we have, uh, even within the existing EU member state composition, uh, we have challenges ahead from other member states. Um, Tishuk, back to uh, unionism and UK again. Mary C. Murphy from UCC asks, the Irish government's relationship with unionism has been a casualty of Brexit. How does the government propose to fix its relationship with unionism and to cultivate constructive relations with new unionist leaders? And um, then a not unrelated question from Paul Kilgariff. Uh, the leaving of the UK has left Ireland somewhat isolated in a geographical sense. What measures or policies can Ireland put in place to become more integrated with mainland Europe? And he suggests with the question mark, join the Schengen area? Mm -hmm. Three things. First of all, in terms of unionism, um, just we're going to continue engaging and there will be challenges and, and clearly protocol presents a challenge uh, in, in the current context, but we will not stop being an open door to, to all opinion in Northern Ireland and to unionism in particular. And the Shared Island uh, initiative is very much a part of that, uh, to create a new dialogue on, on the island, irrespective of one's constitutional preferences, to deal with issues like climate change, energy, uh, research, uh, a whole range of areas that we can work together on. And part of our discussions on Friday with the British Prime Minister was to even add an East-West dimension to some of that, particularly in the context of research, for example, um, and to see can we, and that's kind of what we're working on. Um, and in, in, uh, just to diver, uh, digress a bit in terms of the Friday meeting, really originally was scheduled to deal with um, the post-Brexit British-Irish relationship and how we can develop that absence the EU structures that was the framework for a relationship as it developed um, over the last um, 50 years. So we have to work at seeing how we can strengthen and, and, and consolidate the, the British-Irish relationship in a post-Brexit situation. Now part of that means we have to work um, consistently uh, towards an EU-UK relationship that is sustained and constructive and that's a point we've made to the United Kingdom and to Europe. Um, and uh, there can be a tendency, and there could be a tendency for petty disputes uh, being elevated to suit put domestic political consumption. And that's something that needs to be avoided because there is a very real need for the UK and the EU to have a constructive, sustained relationship into the future. And that allies and aligns itself, sorry, with the new emphasis from, from the United States, which wants uh, a new refreshed uh, transatlantic partnership. And that has to be with Europe and the UK. Uh, because there are very similar shared values um, um, in, 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 in relation um, uh, to, to, to that. Uh, and in terms of, there is a fair question, which we need to take time to reflect on in terms of the, the Schengen issue. We, we worked hard to maintain the common travel area, um, but we, we will reflect on all of that. Uh, and we are, we, we strengthened our footprint in Europe, when I say our diplomatic footprint within Europe, uh, and will continue to do that. Uh, and the level of engagement both within member states um, and indeed at the Perm Rep as well. Um, so that, um, it, and that will mean, you know, that will have to continue, sorry, uh, to be expanded into the future. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the other issue, sorry, the other issue I was going to say is the initiative we launched about two weeks ago, uh, with Mr. Simon Coveney and Mr. Thomas Byrne in relation to working strategically to increase the level and numbers of Irish people working within European Union institutions. Uh, I know, uh, Catherine, you'll be, you know this more than most, but I think the, the, we need to reverse a trend. Um, it looks good at the moment, but the future, uh, unless we strategically change direction and work very energetically and proactively in Ireland, in, I think, languages in our schools, for example, because language competency is important. I think that's kind of slipped off the agenda somewhat. Uh, and I think we need to get that back on a primary and post-primary level. But we need more Irish people looking to Europe for careers uh, and for development. And uh, so we have a comprehensive strategy now published by government to increase the numbers working in EU institutions. That's important also in terms of our strategic objectives within the European Union. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Taoiseach. And um, based on my own personal experience, I would certainly encourage any Irish person to give it a go and to, to play our role in strengthening uh, where Europe goes from here. And the clock on these occasions is always our enemy. And there were actually one or two questions about that, increasing Irish representation in the institutions. So thank you for uh, forestalling those questions. Um, we had promised um, to finish by one o'clock and I want to keep to that. So Taoiseach, one last question. Um, and from Joe Mulholland. Is Antisha concerned about the imminent departure of Dr. Angela Merkel from the political scene and the difficulties which Emmanuel Macron will face in the forthcoming presidential elections in France next year? Yeah, first of all, um, yes, in some respects, but you, you know, one has to give those who come forward opportunities too, you know. Uh, I suppose the strength of the union is, and it should be, and all political systems should be, that no individual is indispensable. That said, I think uh, Angela Merkel has been a tour of strength. And from my experience over the last year, uh, uh, Angela Merkel's impact on, on, on the union is profound. It's strong. Um, and it was key with Emmanuel Macron, for example, to getting that key decision uh, at the July Council in terms of first time ever an unprecedented move in terms of own, you know, own resources and in terms of borrowing collectively uh, to, to, to help fund our way out of the, the pandemic. Uh, so there, without doubt, it will uh, be a moment of change. I think Emmanuel Macron is, is a very formidable politician, and I think he's uh, also, I think, is applying a very constructive approach to the European Union and has a, has a bold approach to, to Europe itself and to its future. And he wants to be ambitious for, for, for Europe. Um, so, but it is a moment of change uh, th th this next 12 months in respect of Europe. Um, but again, we have to work to ensure that the strengths of the institutions uh, will take us through this. Taoiseach, on behalf of the Institute, um, can I thank you very much for um, an extremely stimulating address, but also for your willingness to take uh, such a huge range of questions and to answer them all um, very well. Um, we um, were delighted to have had you deliver the Brendan Halligan Memorial Address, and I can think of uh, no better way to um, remember a man who spent so much time and energy devoting himself to the cause of the European Union uh, without being too idealistic, with understanding um, that it has its flaws, that it's, it's made up of human beings, but always with the, the same view that you have articulated, uh, the conviction that Ireland's place is in the European Union, that we can contribute to it and that we benefit from it. So thank you very much for taking the time with us today to celebrate um, Brendan's legacy and um, to look forward uh, to the, the future uh, that we will all play together as Ireland in the European Union. And thank you to the very many numerous uh, participants in this webinar. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but I think we managed to cover a very broad range of topics and the Taoiseach has been very generous with his time and very forthcoming in his answers. So, Gurv Mil Mahagat Taoiseach. Thank you very much indeed, um, Catherine. And just to say, I'm delighted to have had this opportunity uh, particularly to remember Brendan, uh, who I think had a wonderful form of what I would term relaxed wit and good humour. Uh, you know, he, he just uh, took life in its stride. And I think the Institute is one of his great legacies to Irish public discourse and debate, uh, which I know is much sought after. Many, many people, uh, you know, gain so much uh, from this Institute in so many different ways. And uh, we remember him and we miss him uh, and his contribution to Irish public life. Thank you very much. Thank you.